Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on the top contract cases from 2017. My name is Roddy Forgey and I will be presenting along with my colleague Daisy Bovingdon. I am a member of the Trade and Commerce team and advise on all aspects relating to the negotiation and drafting of commercial contracts. Daisy is a member of the Commercial and International Disputes team and deals with a range of disputes concerning commercial contracts and intellectual property. So today's session will focus on the five cases listed on the slide. The Supreme Court has been asked to consider some unusual scenarios of the past year, including all contracts made over dinner and whether a ship owner's opportunism in response to a breach ought to reduce their entitlement to damages. We will also look at two important contractual interpretation cases. Firstly, on whether a warranty or an indemnity provision should prevail. And secondly, what terms should take priority in the face of competing provisions. We will also look at a case applying the law on the recovery of economic loss as a consequence of damage to another's property. For each case, we will summarize the facts, the legal issues, and the implications of the decision. There is a chat box available on your screen. Please do ask any questions by typing into the box, and we will answer either during the webinar or by contacting you directly later today. I'll now hand over to Roddy to introduce our first case. Our first case is Wood against Capita Insurance Service Limited. This is a Supreme Court decision which concerns the interpretation of an indemnity provision in a share purchase agreement. Indemnity provisions are an important mechanism by which parties entering into a contractual relationship can allocate risk. This case shows what pitfalls may lie ahead if the parties fail to give full consideration not simply to the relevant indemnity clause itself, but to the provisions in the wider contract. In terms of the summary of the facts, Capita Insurance purchase the entire share capital of an insurance brokerage company from Wood, a 94% shareholder in the company, and two other sellers, each of whom had a far smaller shareholding. Shortly after the sale, employees of the insurance brokerage company raised concerns about the company's sales processes, which had resulted in some customers paying substantially more than they had been quoted online by aggregator sites such as Confuse.com. In response, the company carried out an internal review of its sales processes, which, according to the court, established that telephone operators had misled customers into believing that an underwriter had required a higher premium or that their risk profile was worse than it was. Capita and the company reported these findings to the Financial Services Authority. The FSA found that the customers had been treated unfairly, had suffered a detriment, and that there would have to be redress. Capita claimed for the estimated cost of compensation, interest, and the cost of the relevant remediation scheme, which amounted to roughly £2.4 million. The SBA contained contrasting warranty and indemnity provisions. On the one hand, Schedule 4 of the SBA set out detailed and wide-ranging warranties. However, liability for these warranties was time-limited to two years following completion of the sale. On the other hand, Clause 7.11 in the SPA provided an indemnity to the purchaser against any loss arising out of claims or complaints against the company, the sellers, or any relevant person. These claims had to be registered with the Financial Services Ombudsman, the FSA, or any other authority, and they had to relate to the period of mis-selling of any insurance product or service. This case primarily concerned the interpretation of the Clause 7.11 indemnity. Capita argued that this clause should cover any complaints which were made by employees of the company and which were lastly referred to the FSA by the company itself. Wood disputed this on the basis that a condition for the triggering of the indemnity was that there must be either claims by customers or complaints made to the regulatory authorities. In coming to its decision, the court considered it necessary to place the clause in the context of the contract as a whole and to consider whether the wider relevant factual matrix gives guidance as to its meaning. It considered what business common sense suggested both from the point of view of Capita as the purchaser and Wood as the seller. The court noted that in the tug of war of commercial negotiation, business common sense can rarely assist the court in ascertaining on which side of the line the central line marking the tug of war rope lay when negotiations ended. Having acknowledged this limitation, the court turned to consider the clause in more detail, breaking down its constituent parts and noting rival interpretations. 
however, ultimately concluded that detailed points of style and syntax are of little assistance in construing an admittedly opaque clause. Ultimately, it was the inclusion of Schedule 4 that was a key factor in determining the Court's decision. The Court noted that had these further warranties not been incorporated into the SPA, the requirement to have complaint made by a customer might have appeared anomalous. However, according to the Court, the warranty set out in Schedule 4 probably would have covered the circumstances which eventuated. This fact influenced the Court, who went on to state that it is not contrary to business common sense for the parties to agree wide-ranging warranties which are subject to a time limit, and in addition to agree a further indemnity which is not subject to any such time limit, but is triggered only in limited circumstances. The Supreme Court ultimately agreed with the approach taken by the Court of Appeal and held that capita should not be indemnified for losses which arose from the mis-selling that the company referred to the FSA itself. The so-called rules on contractual interpretation have been portrayed as swinging like a pendulum between literalist and purposive approaches in recent years. However, Lord Hodge, who delivered the unanimous decision of the Supreme Court in this case, was at pains to stress that key contract interpretation cases, Rainy Sky from 2011 and Arnold against Britain from 2015, were saying the same thing, and that the recent history of the common law of contractual interpretation is one of continuity rather than change. That conclusion is largely supported by the approach the Supreme Court took here in interpreting the relevant provisions. A literalist reading, rejecting any suggestion that it should seek to improve the language by reference to the alleged commerciality of the outcome, but giving consideration to business common sense so far as it could have clarified the objective intention of the parties when agreeing the contract. This case is an example of the courts being unable to rewrite a contract merely because one of the parties has made a bad bargain. However, the decision also demonstrates that where there are several rival interpretations in light of the context, the courts can give weight to their implications by reaching a view as to which is more commercially sensible. The weight given to factors such as business common sense or the wider factual matrix is likely to be greater when the natural meaning of the words is opaque to use Lord Hodge's term, or inconsistent with the wider agreement. The key lesson for lawyers drafting commercial contracts is to ensure that the natural meaning of the words being used is clear and consistent with the wider contract, avoiding rival provisions wherever possible. So turning now to our next case, which is the English High Court case of McInnes and Gross, and considers whether a contract had been formed during a conversation over dinner. The case addresses three important legal points. Firstly, the legal test to establish whether a contract has been formed. Secondly, how to identify the correct parties to a contract. And thirdly, evidence. What might you need to show a court to prove that a contract exists? So a summary of the facts. The claimant was an investment banker named Mr. McInnes. The first defendant was Mr. Gross. He was the principal figure behind a group of com companies which we will call Running Bull. Mr. McInnes claimed that Mr. Gross had agreed to pay him a fee for services in connection with the sale of Running Bull. The sale completed, and Mr. McInnes calculated that fee at a rich 13.5 million euros. Mr. Gross refused to pay. He did not consider there was any agreement between the parties. Mr. McInnes then raised an action to try to recover that 13.5 million. Mr. McInnes argued that a contract had been formed during a conversation over dinner in a Mayfair restaurant. At that time, Mr. McInnes was an employee of Investec. Following the meeting, Mr. McInnes emailed Mr. Gross discussing various aspects of running ball and also setting out Mr. McInnes's own position. It says, I am delighted that we are agreed on headline terms. I think the role of CEO of HTD Holding is an excellent formula to kick things off, and I appreciate the suggestion that I would be able to elect a strike price for options for 15% of running ball. This email is the only contemporaneous record of the discussion from that evening, and was relied upon by Mr. McInnes as evidence of contractual terms. So the legal issues. 
The court referred to the leading case of RTS Limited and Molkerai, which sets out the general principles of contract formation, and that citation is on the slide. These are, one, whether there is evidence that leads objectively to a conclusion that the parties intended to create legal relations, and secondly, agreements have been made on all essential terms required to form a contract, even if certain significant terms are still to be finalized. In cases where there is no evidence of an express agreement, such as where there is no written contract, the burden of proving intention rests with the party claiming that a contract exists. And the citation for this authority is the IOPC case shown on the slide. So what about the court's assessment of the evidence available? Well, the really unique factor about this case is the scarcity of written evidence available to assist the court in determining whether a contract existed. The court found both parties to be credible on the whole, but that the two men had left the dinner with very different views of what had happened. In assessing the evidence, the court considered the informality of the setting, whether there was agreement on the essential terms, and also discussed a potential language barrier. Looking first at informality of setting, the fact that the discussion took place so informally means that the court should closely scrutinise whether there was any intention to create legal relations. In terms of the agreement on essential terms, the court found there was no agreement on the critical issue of Mr McInnes's remuneration. The court viewed the deal as complex and the more complicated the subject matter, the more likely the parties are to want to enshrine their contract in a written document. The overriding difficulty for Mr McInnes was that the agreement was not recorded in, his, in the email he sent to Mr Gross following the dinner. In the court's view, the email included no reference to key fundamental terms and insufficient certainty regarding the services to be provided. Turning to the language barrier, Parties must take care when negotiating contracts in a language other than the first language of any of the parties. Although the claimant was, flu was fluent in English, there were nuances identified in the use of language where the German and English meanings differed. Although this was not a critical element leading to the court's decision, it does highlight that the meaning can be lost in translation between seemingly fluent speakers. Ultimately, the court concluded that, that there was no intention to create legal relations and therefore no binding contract. The court found that the alleged contract did, did not and could not have come into existence between the parties to this litigation. Mr McInnes had met with Mr Gross as an employee of Investec. The court found that, had there been any contract made during the meeting, then this would have been made on behalf of Investec and not Mr McInnes personally. In addition, Mr Gross would have not have had the authority to enter into any such arrangement without the agreement of the other shareholder in Running Ball, a fact which was known to Mr McInnes. So what are the implications of this decision? It is perfectly possible to agree a business contract through words alone, always rem remembering that consumer contracts are treated differently. The difficulty is, how do you prove on the balance of probabilities that a contract exists when the only available evidence before the court is your testimony? Another high-profile case on oral contracts this year was the case of Blue and Ashley. Blue failed to establish that Mike Ashley of Sports Direct had agreed to pay him a £15 million consultancy fee if he was able to raise the company's share price by to £8. The conversation had taken place in a pub and much alcohol consumed by all. The court held that no reasonable person present would have thought that the offer to pay Mr Blue £15 million was serious and was intended to create a contract. And no one who was actually present in the horse and groom that evening, including Mr Blue, did in fact think so at the time. They all thought it was a joke. The fact that Mr Blue has since convinced himself that the offer was serious and that a legally binding agreement was made shows only that the human capacity for wishful thinking knows few bounds. So our advice is, of course, document your agreements carefully. You will want your contract to be clear and robust, offering certainty and confidence to all parties, including any third parties it might affect. 
ensure you identify the correct parties to any contract. This is not always easy. Professionals often wear various hats. They may have different directorships, they may be shareholders, they may be acting in their personal capacity, for example. Ensure that the entity you contract with has the appropriate authority to agree and perform the contract. Always discuss the proposed agreement and options available with your legal advisors. So turning now to our third case, Crude Cruden Buildings and Renewables Limited and Scottish Water. Uh, this is a legal debate concerning title to sue. So just to remind ourselves what is title to sue, essentially having the legal right to bring an action against a party in respect of a wrong or loss you have suffered. Why does it matter? Well, when entering into a contract that is going to cost you money and effort to perform, a fundamental question is, who can I recover from if something goes wrong? As we will see, there are instances where the law provides no remedy to an aggrieved party against the wrongdoer because there is no contract governing the relationship. This means that a loss may simply lie where it falls if parties have not made provision to cover certain risks. So, turning to the case itself. Cruden was the appointed contractor carrying out building works at a site owned by Glasgow Housing Association. There was an escape of foul water onto the site, causing a 19-week delay in Cruden's operations, and Cruden suffered economic loss as a result. Cruden raised an action against Scottish Water, who had caused the damage, to try to recover that loss. Scottish Water challenged Cruden's case at debate. In terms of the legal arguments, Scottish Water argued that Cruden did not have title to sue. The basis of their argument was that Cruden's loss was as a result of damage to property being belonging to another, in this case, Glasgow Housing Association. Scottish Water founded their argument on the fact that Cruden did not have a possessory right in the land that had been damaged, such as ownership or a lease interest. Cruden was the appointed contractor and as such had a limited contractual right to be at the site. So what is the law? Well, Scottish Water relied upon the line of authorities as summarised in the case of NACAP Limited and Moffat Plant Limited. Again, the citation on the slide. This followed the leading House of Lords decision of Lee and Sullivan Limited. And that says, in order to enable a person to claim in negligence for loss caused to him by reason of loss or damage to property, he must have had either the legal ownership of or a possessory title to the property when the loss or damage occurred. It is not enough for him to have only had contractual rights in relation to such property which have been adversely affected by the loss of or damage to it. Lord Bannatyne also referred to the 19th century English decision of Cattle and Stockton Waterworks Company, which dealt with the same situation as Cruden's case. Cattle had held that damage sustained by the plaintiff by reason of his contract becoming less profitable in consequence of injury to the owner's property gave the plaintiff no right of action against the defendant. So Lord Bannatyne applied these authorities and Cruden's action was dismissed in whole. Cruden would have needed a right of possession similar to an owner in order to establish title to sue. Cruden only had use of the site in order to make a profit, and the wrong was done to the site which caused economic loss. The contractual right to occupy the site was of a wholly different character, nature, and extent to that set out in NACAP, and it had none of the elements necessary to make it similar to a right of ownership. So why is the case? You might ask why a party in Cruden's position cannot recover against the party who caused the harm. The answer is found in public policy. The purpose of the rule is to limit the liability of the wrongdoer and to provide legal certainty. The fact that the outcome left Cruden without a remedy was irrelevant. So what are the implications of this decision? Well, a party working on site without an ownership or leasehold interest needs to ensure that this risk is managed, for example, through contractual indemnities and insurance provision. 
discuss the options both within your own commercial team and with your legal advisors to ensure you are not left exposed. So next up, we have the Supreme Court case of Fulton Shipping Incorporated of Panama and Globalia Business Travel. And I'll hand over to Roddy to summarize the facts. Fulton was the owner of a cruise ship called the New Flamenco. Globalia was the, char the charter of that ship under a time charter party. Globalia re-delivered the New Flamenco in October 2007. Fulton argued that the vessel had been returned two years early, as the parties had entered into an oral agreement to extend the charter party to November 2009. Fulton considered Global Isle was in repudiatory breach of contract and accepted the breach as terminating the contract. Fulton then sold the vessel. Fulton raised arbitration proceedings against Global Isle to try to recover the profits they would have received had the charter party completed its full term. The startling factor in this case was the impact market conditions had had on the new Flamenco's value. The ship realized $23.7 million on sale in 2007. However, by the end of the prescribed term of the charter party two years later, it was worth only $7 million. Fulton had therefore made a healthy profit as a result of selling the vessel in 2007. So Fulton commenced the arbitration proceedings. Initially, Globalia disputed having ever made the second extension. They lost this point and did not seek to challenge that aspect on appeal. The arbitrator decided that Globalia was in breach and liable to Fulton in damages. However, the loss to Fulton as a result of the cancelled charter party could be offset by the economic benefit derived by Fulton from the early sale. This extinguished the value of Fulton's claim. Fulton appealed to the High Court. The legal question was whether the arbitrator was right to factor in the sale price achieved in 2007 when he calculated how much Fulton was entitled to recover for the breach of the Charter Party. The court held that the price difference was irrelevant since there was no legal causation between the breach and the owner's decision to sell New Flamenco when they did. The court set out a number of legal principles from the case law. So firstly from Bradburn, the 19th century case, again the citation is on the slide. In order for a benefit to be taken into account in reducing the loss recoverable by the innocent party for a breach of contract, it is generally speaking a necessary condition that the benefit is caused by the breach. It is not enough that the benefit would not have been obtained but for the breach. It is also not sufficient if the breach has merely provided the occasion or context for the innocent party to obtain the benefit or merely triggered his doing so. And the authority for that is the Elena D'Amico uh, case of 1980. In applying these principles, the judge found that Fulton was not required to give credit for the benefit it had realized on sale because it was not a benefit which was legally caused by the breach. The fall in value of the new flamenco was as a result of the financial crisis and not the breach of the charter. The breach merely provided the context or occasion for the sale. Importantly, it was open to the owner to sell the new flamenco at any point, subject to a buyer honoring the charter party contract. The Court of Appeal disagreed with the judge's analysis, and there Lord Justice Longmore considered that if a replacement charter party would have been taken into consideration in a damages calculation, and uh, the court found that it would have been, and followed a couple of cases there, the Kildare and the Wren, then the Court of Appeal considered that the sale ought also to be taken into account, again, so that the value uh, would have been extinguished. Uh, the Supreme Court, however, favored the judge's analysis and held that Fulton's decision to sell the new flamenco was a commercial decision unrelated to any breach by Globalia. The court saw nothing about the premature termination of the charter party, which made it necessary to sell the vessel. Fulton made a commercial decision at its own risk about the disposal of an interest in the vessel, which had nothing to do with the charter party. Separately, the court explained why Fulton's decision to sell was not an act of mitigating their loss 
and ought not to be taken into account on that analysis either. The relevant mitigation in this context would have been the acquisition of an income stream alternative to that under the original charter party, for example, a replacement charter party. The sale of the vessel was not an act of mitigation because it was incapable of mitigating the loss of that income stream. The court emphasized the importance of causation, an element, uh, an element and essential component of which is that there is a sufficiently close link between the benefit gained and the loss suffered, again referring back to the Bradburn case of 1874. The court considered that the fall in value of the vessel was irrelevant because Fulton's interest in the capital value of the vessel had nothing to do with the loss suffered as a result of the breach of the charter party. So for the sale price of the vessel to be brought into account in assessing damages, that benefit had to have been caused either by the breach of the charter party or by a successful act of mitigation. The court found neither applied. So what about the implications of this? Well, this is undoubtedly an unusual case, as globalized breach of contract would seem to have triggered, if not caused, a windfall for Fulton. It offers a helpful reminder of some important legal principles relevant to assessing damages for breach, and reminds us that the courts will draw a distinction between genuine mitigation of loss and commercial decisions taken following a loss. I'll now hand over to Roddy to introduce our final case. Our final case is from the Supreme Court, MT Odgard and Eon Climate and Renewables UK Robin Rig East Limited. It is another contractual interpretation case which concerned liability for the cost of remedying failed wind turbine foundation structures. MTH agreed to carry out the design, fabrication and installation of the foundations for 60 wind turbine generators for the Robin Rig offshore wind farm in the Solway Firth. The foundation structures failed shortly after completion of the project and a dispute arose about whether MTH was responsible for the required remedial work, which was valued at 26.25 million euros. Technical requirements regarding the design and build works were contained in tender documents issued to MTH, which were incorporated into the contract between the parties. Those technical requirements required the foundations to be built in accordance with an international standard for offshore wind turbines known as J101. The contract also required the work to be designed for a minimum site-specific design life of 20 years without major retrofits or refurbishments, and the foundations to ensure a lifetime of 20 years in every aspect without planned replacement. The technical requirements relating to the design were stated to be a minimum requirement of EON. It was, no, it was not known at the time of design or construction, but the international J101 standard contained a serious error in a prescribed equation used in calculating the strength of the base of the turbines, meaning that the strength had been overestimated by a factor of about 10. As a result, it was not possible for the wind turbine to last the 20 years set out in the contract and it fell to the court to decide who should bear the cost of the remedial works. The decision of the Supreme Court was delivered by Lord Newberger, who explained that the natural meaning of the technical requirements set out in the contract involved MTH warranting either that the foundations would have a lifetime of 20 years or agreeing that the design of the foundations would be such as to give them a lifetime of 20 years. Lord Newberger considered there to be only two arguments open to MTH as to why the relevant paragraph should not be given its natural effect. The first argument was that such an interpretation results in an obligation which is inconsistent with MTH's obligation to construct the works in accordance with the J101 international standard. However, this was rejected by the Supreme Court on the basis that where a contract contains terms which require an item which is to be produced in accordance with a prescribed design, and which, when provided, will comply with prescribed criteria, and literal conformity with the prescribed design will inevitably result in the product falling short of one or more of the prescribed criteria, it by no means follows that the two terms are mutually inconsistent. What should happen in this situation, according to Lord Newberger, is that the more rigorous or demanding of the two standards or requirements must prevail, 
as the less rigorous can properly be treated as a minimum requirement. The second argument that Lord Newburgh considered to be open to MTH was that the 20-year requirement is simply too slender a thread on which to hang such an important and potentially onerous obligation. Such an argument relies on ambiguities in the drafting and the fact that the obligation was supposedly tucked away in the contractual documentation. However, the Supreme Court reminded us that inelegant, inelegant and clumsy drafting is not a reason to depart from the usual rules of contract interpretation. The Court could not see why it could be said to be an improbable or unbusinesslike interpretation, especially as it was the natural meaning of the words used and was unsurprising in light of the references in the technical specification to design life of 20 years and the minimum requirement. On this reasoning, the Supreme Court held that MTH was liable for the remedial costs. The case highlights that even where terms appear inconsistent with one another, the courts will endeavour to give effect to the natural meaning of the words used in the contract. The case is also a reminder that a contract will be, contractor will be bound by his bargain, even though he can show an unanticipated difficulty or even impossibility in achieving the result desired. Products and services must comply with this right, the prescribed criteria on the basis that, even if the employer or purchaser has specified or approved the design or specification, it will generally be the contractor who is taking the risk that by working to the design, it may be incapable of meeting the criteria. So that concludes today's webinar. Thank you for taking the time to tune in and listen. Your speakers today have been Body Forgy and me, Daisy Bovingdon. If you have any questions or would like to discuss anything arising out of today's webinar, please contact us using the details on the slide. Thank you for listening, and Wadi and I look forward to welcoming you again next time.